Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 210 of the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers here, as always, with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. We are taking listener questions today. Yay. Yeah, one of our favorite things to do. It is one of our favorite things to do. So it will be this week and next week, back-to-back listener questions. Thank you to everybody who sends in listener questions. We love hearing from you. We especially love to hear your voices when you record at speakpipe.com slash the mom hour. Several of our questions today, um, we will get to hear our listeners' voices, and that's our absolute favorite way. So thank you guys for taking the time and trusting us with our you know, it's not expert advice, but it's our our well-earned experience, I guess. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, we have a lot to get to today, so we're going to take a quick break and then dive into our first question. All right. We are excited to welcome back our sponsor, Epic, today. Epic is my summer solution to screen time that is not actually screen time. We talked in a recent episode, Megan, about how I bust out tablets for my kids very occasionally, so it's a big treat. And when that tablet time is Epic only, it means I got to work or record the podcast, and the kids have free reign to browse from thousands of high-quality eBooks, audiobooks, and read-to-me books. We still go to the library all the time and read paper books in our house, but having a digital wonderland of popular books instantly accessible is so great, especially in the summertime. We have one family account where I can customize and even create book lists for each of my kids' unique profiles. And then when they open up Epic, the recommendations are tailored to their reading level and interests, which is amazing. I know a lot of parents are looking for ways to keep kids reading over the summer. And if you and your child have goals for reading daily, Epic is great because it tracks their minutes and their pages read, and it even emails you a weekly report. And with our deal for two months free, we've got you covered for pretty much the whole summer. So you can head to getepic.com and use the code MOMHOUR to get two months totally free. Again, it's getepic.com and the promo code is MOMHOUR for two months totally free. Okay, everybody, we've been talking about this free photo book from Chatbooks for a while now, and maybe you're thinking you'd like to try it, but don't have the time to create a photo book. So I just want to take a second to say, I usually hate putting together digital photo books, but Chatbooks really does make it so easy. There's only one photo per page. So not only is the book really visually striking, but you also don't have to worry about doing that thing where you're dragging and dropping into different layouts or any of that stuff. Sarah and I have both made books in 10 minutes or less, and not only do the books make fantastic gifts, They're also a great thing to make for yourself. And also, this is something you could do the next time you have a few minutes of unscheduled time, like maybe when you're waiting in your car to pick up a kid from school or you get the gift of getting out of a conference call 10 minutes early. (laughs) You can put it on your phone, put the app on your phone and just use it when you have a few minutes. So give it a try. Download the Chatbooks app, link it up to your social accounts or your photos on your phone and see how easy it is to use. The first $10 is on us with the code the mom hour and that credit will get you a 30 page soft cover book. So basically we're giving you a free book. That code will expire on June 30th, which is not that far from now guys. So don't wait again. The code is the mom hour and just download that chat books app right now. All right. We're going to get right to our first question. It comes from Colleen and we'll play it now. Hi, Sarah and Megan. This is Colleen from New Hampshire. I have a four year old son. And then I also have a son who is almost two and my husband is going to be going away for four and a half to five weeks on a work trip. And quite honestly, I am terrified for my own sanity and I'm feeling like I'm just going to be so lonely during this whole month by myself. So I'm just looking for some tips, hacks, anything, advice on getting through the four and a half weeks alone. My boys are wonderful, of course, but they can also be super challenging. My four-year-old, he is still needing a lot of attention from me. He wants to talk to me nonstop and ask why thousands of times a day. And his little brother is super needy. He wants to be held by me constantly and man has temper tantrums about everything. So advice, ideas for how I can keep my sanity and survive. (laughs) That would be great. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, Colleen, I just have to tell you, um, I know Sarah and I have both been there. Um, I spent probably the first, gosh, 
I don't know, five years of motherhood with a tr- very often traveling spouse and then kind of went back to it when Clara was a baby. We had a year where we actually um, where John was traveling back and forth and only home on the weekends. So I've been there. I get it. Yeah. Um, I think my first piece of advice would be that the new routine will begin to feel normal. Um, if you're patient, it might take a couple of weeks, maybe like, maybe like right around the time you're really getting your swing of things is probably when he'll come home <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll have to readjust when he gets back. And sometimes that can be just as hard, honestly, yeah. cause you get used to doing things your, your way. And sometimes there's a little, there are little blessings in that, you know? So like pay attention and, and keep your eyes open for those, like getting to hog the remote or sleep all mm-hmm. over the bed or whatever it is, <laughs> like whatever little bit of um, pleasure you can get out of it. But I think if I had another piece of advice, it would be to don't forget your social needs. Like it really can be lonely, especially if you're used to hanging out with your husband after the kids go to bed. Um, so it's not just the parenting stuff. I always found that to be relatively not easy, but like you just get in your routine and you get used to kind of managing everything on your own. For me, it was always much harder when they were occupied and they went to bed and then it was just me mm-hmm. alone in the house. Um, so it's going to also be harder for you to get out on your own. So you're going to have to improvise. So this might be a good time to think about hosting friends regularly for dinner or maybe having someone over like a friend or a group of friends over for a beverage and a chat after the kids go to bed or something like that. Um, you can also do something for yourself that feels a little bit special after the kids go to bed. So maybe you pick a show that has a ton of content like Game of Thrones or go back in time and watch, you know, I don't know, the X-Files or something, something that has tons of content Mm -hmm. and make a little date with yourself where at night you, after the kids are in bed, you have a treat. That's something you can look forward to because otherwise that time can be pretty lonely. I love that. And I think like both of those last couple of things you said, the social piece and the entertainment, um, I just would find that I was so brain dead and kind of exhausted that in the moment I, I wasn't always prepared to make the best choice for myself. So right. like planning ahead to have something to look forward to. Or, um, I remember meeting up with little kids and even going to a restaurant with a fellow mom who was solo parenting for a while. And it would be a total, I mean, it would be a disaster of a meal. Cause we'd have little kids that we were trying to go to this burger place, but it was something on the calendar and we survived, mm-hmm. you know, and just that social interaction and getting out. So I totally agree. Yeah. And it, and if it, and if getting out feels like too much, I think it's okay for your home to become the hangout spot Mm -hmm. for a while. Like Like, I think your friends will, will understand that it's just easier for you to do it that way. And, um, that can be really fun. And I I totally agree about like in the moment, I am somebody who, if I sit down and think I'm going to watch some TV or I'm going to watch Netflix, I cannot think of what to watch ever. (laughs) It takes so much mental energy just for me to like choose something. So having something you've already kind of committed to, even if it's dumb and just fluff. Oh yeah. I mean, the fluffier, the better, the more engaging to just kind of give your mind a break. Uh, I have made the mistake of trying to choose book, a book or a show that I'm not super into. And then what I end up doing is looking at my phone instead and it just feels gross. So yeah, have something to look forward to. Um, well, I, number one, I just want to say that all of us who've gone through this, I think would say you're, you are stronger than you think. And until you've tested yourself in this area of like intense solo parenting, you really don't even know what you're capable of. And yes, it will be hard. Um, but you will be really proud of yourself just on Sunday, Megan, we were talking about adventures. This is like a different kind of adventure. Um, I remember I have a very clear memory of having a mom friend whose husband traveled a lot. And when her kids were babies and thinking I could never do that, I could never do that. My husband is so helpful. He's home at five 30 most days. Like I could never do that. And then he switched job roles. And when I was pregnant with my third, started traveling a ton. And of course I could do it. Not only could I do it, but I added a pregnancy and a baby to the mix and I still could do it. So I think at the end of this, you'll feel super accomplished and you'll also just feel really proud of your boys and what everybody, yep. I, I have this feeling almost of like teamwork when, yep. when we're, when we're solo, it's like, okay, guys, we can do this. Um, a couple of just practical tips, <laughs> feed and water, feed and hydrate yourself as yes. best as you possibly can proactively. It's so easy to just be eating chicken nuggets off the kids' plates. If there's no other adult to cook for, or having like a big glass of wine at night, cause you're so tired and lonely and then you don't feel so great the next day. So just set some achievable self-care parameters and, and don't go overboard. You're not also going to train for a marathon when your husband's gone for a month, but some achievable self-care kind of goals, and then just make it, just commit to sticking to them. Drink 
drinking water, going to bed at a certain time, and then make it easy on yourself. So like maybe it's time to try a meal delivery service or like get my favorite Trader Joe's salads for lunch and have that healthy food easy. Don't kid yourself that you're also going to cook yourself a healthy meal when the kids are you know, eating toddler food. So I think just, just know how important that is for your long-term energy and health and mental health. Um, let's, I want to yeah. talk really quickly about the self-care thing. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to notice or to note that the way you do self-care right now, if you're good at it or even practicing it at all, like things like, when do you take a relaxing bath or a shower or when do you go to the gym or when do you go for a walk or whatever might have to completely change Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it might be that you're relying on an energy level at night you won't have, or it might be that you were relying on a spouse being home when he's not, you might have to look into things like gym daycare that you've never looked at before. Like there's, there are be creative. There are Mm -hmm. solutions out there. If you think about it and there's ways to get those, like, don't let that all that go just because, um, just because, everything else is changing, right. figure out ways. In fact, if anything, double down on it yeah. and figure out ways to incorporate into this new schedule. Including if that means making some sacrifices on how you usually parent your kids. I'm thinking specifically about screen time and convenience foods, like happy meals and stuff. Like, I yeah. mean, you, you're allowed to make some allowances. I think years ago, Megan, we did an episode on traveling spouses and I'll link it up in the show notes. But I remember you having this very wise way of putting it that like, you have to relax your standards enough to give yourself grace. But if you relax them too much and just let like your diet and the house and the, the mess kind of just like go into this dark place, then it actually is counterproductive. So like you have right. to find that spot of like, it's going to be okay to order pizza a little bit more. And it's going to be okay to like, uh, let the kids watch some more TV because I'm solo. And I, I I don't, there's only one of me, but on the other hand, when it goes too far in that extreme, nobody feels good. And it actually can mean more work, I think of dealing with, you know, the ramifications. So I remember having this little routine I got into, um, during one of these phases when John was traveling a lot and the kids were still little and really needy. Um, you know, and now it's kind of funny cause my kids are older and I'm with them by themselves a lot of the time, but it just doesn't matter anymore. They're just so big now. Yeah. Um, but I remember where I would take them and we would go to dairy queen and we'd get a box of dilly bars mm-hmm. and then we would come home, like we'd go through the drive through and then we'd come home. And the rule was, I made this rule that kids could never eat ice cream in the house. Okay. And I did that because then I was guaranteed to be in the house by myself for like at least 15 minutes because dilly bars take a long time to eat. Yeah. I love and it. I used, I used that a lot. I love it. I love <laughs> like, it. Like sometimes we were getting ice cream like three times a week, but it would be like, okay. And everyone's, and then they're all excited about it. Yeah. Like no one's complaining. No one's trying to come in. They're all outside eating their ice cream. And you've been and strapped like, in the car. That's the other yes. thing. Like I looked for many opportunities to be strapped into the car for a little yeah. while and drive throughs yeah. will do that. Yep. For me, it was Chick-fil-A. Um, okay, my last, my last practical tip, um, has to do with the four-year-old in particular. Um, and that is, I think a four-year-old has enough of a concept of time to know, you know, dad's gone. It's going to be a long one. We're in this together. We're a team and you can start to have fun with the kind of the counting down. Um, I mean, four and a half, five weeks is a really long time. I don't know that I would do like a daily countdown the whole time, but maybe, maybe it's a celebration of getting through a week and then another week. And I know like things like paper chains, anything that makes a, a um, passage of time really tangible to a little kid can be fun to help count down the days. So as it gets closer, you know what I mean, Megan, right? Like the paper yeah. chains where you tear yep. off one each day. I mean, think like Advent or something. You're you're crossing something off each day. And I think that could be um, probably fun and also kind of helpful to help the four-year-old understand the passage of time. And so you're going to do great. You'll have to let us know how it goes, Colleen, when this is all, all over. I have uh, one more thing to yeah. add because no, this is all coming back to me now. <laughs> um, I think that you, you might want to think about a reasonable and sustainable and doable communication plan yeah, yep, ahead yep, of yep. time. Um, we've talked many times about when we travel, how it's not always the best thing to call home and talk to the kids. Like sometimes it makes things worse. Sometimes it throws things off for the parent that's home parenting. So depending on your kids and like how they feel about that, it may, and it, depending on what kind of work your husband's going to be doing, he might be doing something where if the kids are really looking forward to a call every night at six and he can't do that because his schedule is super intense or time zone, he might be or time zone or whatever. Remember. Like yeah. you don't, you definitely don't want to set up an expectation that something's going to happen that doesn't happen um, or force something to happen that actually doesn't solve anything or help, you know? Um, so there's that. And then for you, like, don't, mm-hmm. I, I would be very careful about making sure that you're not so reliant on 
a specific time of day phone call or mm-hmm. whatever it is that you set up your entire day around it. And then maybe it doesn't happen. That right. can be crushing. Yeah. Like, and I, I know that the kind of work that John was in for many years, I would really look forward to that call at whatever time of the day. And then sometimes it didn't happen because he was still working. Yeah. And, and then I had to go to bed. So yeah. like if I had looked forward to that all afternoon, it was so disappointing yeah. when it didn't happen. So we just had to find other ways to communicate. No, that's a good one. And I am reminded of that episode that we did. So we'll link that up, Colleen, and anybody else who's going through this because um, we have some more some more in an old episode we did on this. Yep. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question comes from Erica. I will read it. Um, Very nice note came in by email. She says, hi, Megan and Sarah. I have a four-year-old son and I've been getting so many questions lately about whether or not he is in preschool. He isn't and I wasn't planning to send him. I work at home. We have a farm, so lots of interesting play. He has two siblings and goes to some library and church programs to help with socialization. He loves talking to adults and to pal around with us. I've noticed that in our area, parents are incredibly aggressive about having kids reading and generally seeming advanced by the time they go to kindergarten. I'm not keen on putting him in the district preschool because it's five days a week all day, and I think that's too much, but I don't want to be narrow-mindedly holding him back either. I'm interested to hear you talk about the deciding factors for preschool enrollment and any other conversation on that topic. Okay. Well, you know I've got thoughts about this. Well, yeah. I mean, I knew this. You had a very specific (laughs) situation, but it was before we started the podcast, so listeners may not know. Right. Okay. So first of all, you know, your setup sounds ideal to me. You've got your son is getting socialized or social socialization. And I don't really like that word to begin with the way that we use it, because it tends to it. We tend to use it in a way that means hanging out in a classroom setting with other kids your own age. And there's lots of ways to be socialized, to become, you know, to experience socialization. I totally agree. I don't like socialized as a word either because it sounds like something you do to a kid like like then now he is socialized and like can be sent out into society. And that's I know it's just not really how it works. Um, My personal, I guess, litmus test for preschool and I had all of my kids did varying amounts of preschool um, was does it make my life better? (laughs) Yes, that's my my, that's my litmus test for everything. Actually, if preschool, let's just if we're going to establish the um, premise here. That, and I'm not saying preschool is a bad thing. I think on a, you know, on a global scale, on a national scale, it's a fantastic thing. Early childhood education is important and it, it has to happen, right? But it doesn't have to happen this specific way for every specific kid. So I kind of started with the premise that no matter what I've got, you know, my kids hang out with other kids, they hang out with adults. I'm learning with them. They have lots of learning opportunities. They don't need it. So if it, if they're going to do it, it's going to be because my life is in some way better because of it. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds totally selfish, no, but that's I, how I, I treated it. I don't think so. And so Jacob and Isaac, I was working out of the home. So they went to preschool. They did as much preschool as I could cram in. Like the longer the program, the better. And then they had after school care wrapped around either side of it. Um, William, I think by that point I was, well, by that point I was definitely working from home, but I had him enrolled. The boys were in a, um, a parochial school. And I had Will in preschool because I don't even remember why. I think just because we, I think we got actually got a discount because we had the third kid <laughs> in the parochial school. <laughs> and I think it actually, <laughs> no, it truly was. It was kind of like almost free. And so it was like, why not? And then with Owen, he only did one year because honestly, by the time all the other kids were in school, it was Owen and Clara at home. And it was more disruptive to like Clara's naps and things to have to, get her out of the house to take him and drop him off. And preschool, often the program, the the one that he went to, you had to get out of your car, go into the building, Mm -hmm. go into the basement, Mm -hmm. take him to this room at like the far back end of the school. So it was a process and I didn't want to do it every year. So I just did it for one year. He had fun. He would have been fine without it. Claire didn't do any Mm -hmm. because I selfishly, she was my last baby. She was my only daughter. She and I were pals. We liked hanging out together and she was very easy to work around. Um, So, and she didn't like it. Like she didn't really like group settings with kids her age. And I didn't want to push the issue. I knew kindergarten was going to be hard enough. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to put it off. Um, And so I did, I kept her home and we had lots of like, she had like a little craft station that was right next to my workstation and we palled around all day and she got to see what I did. And and she got to kind of be involved in a lot of the stuff I did. Mm -hmm. And we got to kind of do some things that, um, like we got to have a lot of one-on-one time, just mm-hmm. her and I, I remember at a time this. that yeah. 
Yeah, at a time that she was old enough for it to be really fun. And I loved it. I just, I really enjoyed it. And I think we both got a lot of that out of it. And now she's in fourth grade. She's delightfully well socialized. Her <laughs> teachers talk about what a delight she is. And that's the word that comes up. And she's academically right on par. Well, I think so. it's so interesting. Oh, the, the thing you said that I want to highlight again is I think sometimes we get this idea. You said something about being ready for kindergarten. I, I've already forgotten exactly what, what you said or getting ready for other school. And I think sometimes we have this sometimes misguided belief that we've got to do the thing with the kid now to get them ready for the way things are going to be a year from now. And we do this in all kinds of age ranges for all kinds of reasons. Um, But if sometimes that might be the right choice, I guess I'm not going to be black and white about it. But when you think about how much kids change and develop year over year over year, it makes me hesitant to say, let's put the kid in a full day so that they can be ready because kindergarten is a full day. And it's like, right. well, I've never really understood no, like that either. They, yeah. Kindergarten is going to be kindergarten no matter how prepared they are. I mean, I'm, right. I'm now in my third kindergartner and it is a rough transition year. It has been in different ways for everybody. Um, but that is only very slightly mitigated by the quote unquote preparation they had in preschool. I'm not going to say none. Of course, we all bring our experiences and what we're used to then that maybe may, makes it a little easier or not, but I don't think it's a basis for a decision. Does that make sense? Like, no, totally. Let's do the thing. It has to happen regardless. Anyway, the transition, like you said, like kindergarten is going to happen no matter what. And also the first time a kid has a full day is going to happen no matter what. Yes, exactly. Why does it have to happen when they're four? Exactly. That doesn't make logical sense to me. It exactly. never really has. And I see that. I see that argument with middle schooler and high schoolers too. Like, let's make sure, let's get these kids ready for the real world. And it's like, well, wait, no, they get to be 12 now because they're not in the real world. Of course, we want them to have the skills, but that doesn't mean you put the the same real world uh, circumstances on right. them before they're ready. And so I, I see that argument play out over and over again. It always just gives me pause a little bit. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like you, you don't have to get thrown into something. If anything, it makes more sense to gradually work toward that. And I know for for our um, for a lot of districts and a lot of in a lot of school systems like the all day preschool is really an economic decision more than anything Mm -hmm. because they kids need a place to go um when parents are working and it makes sense for them to be in full day preschool and like the the building's already there the classrooms are already there it makes no sense for them to be only half used or to have certain classrooms coming in for half the day and then others so i get all that like i'm totally not against it i just don't think like if it makes your life better and it makes your family life easier and there's a benefit to you and your child do it otherwise any, you know, any, I guess, lack of um, like jump start they might have on reading skills, they will breach that gap. They will bridge the gap. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And that's been shown too. like yeah. early reading doesn't always mean better reading. And a lot of kids, the kids do catch up. I think early literacy is really important, like being a literate person, being literate around your children, which means talking mm-hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And exposing them to language just as much as reading to them and reading with them and, you know, all those things are important. But that doesn't mean you have to set up a preschool classroom in your house either. Right. Like all those skills are that we're they're learning those skills in such a variety of ways and they really will be okay. I agree. Even if they come into kindergarten not knowing the letters the same way the other kids do, they'll catch up. Well, and I mean, I I hope this goes without saying, but I am someone who sent all three of my kids to a pretty typical preschool program in increasing amounts as they got older. And neither you or I, there's like, we love preschools. Right. I think this is more about the outside pressure to do the thing that everyone in your your town is doing, which is, you know, a theme we return to again and again on this show. Um, And I think you're, you always say it best, like anytime you're making the decision based on what those people are doing or thinking. It's probably not the right decision. Yeah. So yeah. I just hope this little guy gets to play on the farm. Till the Me too. <laughs> Imagine how many people would want to send their kids to a farm for preschool. I would have done that. Seriously. Instead of sending my kid to a preschool, I would gladly have sent them to your farm. Yes, actually. Hey, maybe that's, that's like a business. I know. Idea. I'm just thinking <laughs> it would have made things so much easier. Farm preschool. Okay. We are going to take a break and we have two more questions to get to after the break. We're excited to tell you about our sponsor, Original Grain. Original Grain is a collection of really beautiful wood and steel watches. They have unique styles and a variety of colors, and it was so hard to choose one. But I got the summer set, which has like a mustard yellow leather strap and a yellow steel face, and I love it. It's like kind of dresses up my outfit, but it's understated. Um, it's just I just really like the style of it. 
they've got styles for men and women and they're really unique and they have different kind of themes that you can tailor to maybe a dad in your life for father's mm. day um original grain watch would be the perfect gift for dad especially for one of those dads who like they already have everything and they're really hard to shop for because it is unique and it's a really high quality watch that's also very stylish so Original grain watches start at $169 with free shipping worldwide. They have easy returns. And I think this is so cool. They actually plant a tree every time someone buys a watch. So for each watch sold, a tree gets planted. And they've planted over half a million trees so far. So we've got a special deal for you guys. For a limited time, you can save 25% off your order. That's a great deal yeah. at originalgrain.com. But you have to use your special code mom at checkout there are some exclusions so check the website for details um i love my original grain watch i would totally give this as a gift to a dad in my life so again go to originalgrain.com to see for yourself and then use that code mom at checkout and you're going to save 25 percent off your order and thank you to original grain for sponsoring us hey megan we are heading to nashville in november Woohoo! Woo I'm so excited because you have been to the Blistem conference before, but I have not. And I've never been to Nashville. So I'm doubly excited. And I'm excited because I love Blistem. So, yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. And we are actually hoping that some of you listeners out there will join us for Blistem November 14th through 16th. It's one of the premier conferences for lifestyle content creators. That's all of you writers, podcasters, speakers, entrepreneurs, social media mamas, all of you out there. So back when it was founded in 2008, Blistem came to life to develop conversations among bloggers and brands. And now over 10 years later, the Blistem community has evolved to become the leaders, teachers, and mentors in the writing, podcasting, influencer marketing, and content creation space. That is our space. That's where we live. It sure is. So if this sounds like a conference that you would benefit from, you and your business or your blog, head to themomhour.com slash Blistem. That's B-L-I-S-S-D-O-M. And use the promo code BLISS50 to save $50 off your registration. We would love for you to come hang out with us in Nashville in November. Again, we've got the link at themomhour.com slash Blistem. Okay, so our next question is from Kara. Um, and she, I know, Sarah, you're going to have a lot to say about this one because Kara is asking um, about a, a scheduled cesarean that she's got coming up and she's already got a two and a half year old. So let's listen to that and hopefully you can help her out. Hi, Megan and Sarah. This is Kara. I currently have a two and a half year old daughter and I'm due with our second girl in early July. Due to complications from our first birth, looks like we're headed for a scheduled C-section. Despite the complications from the first birth, this is still a bit terrifying for me. All you hear is that C-sections are major surgery and hear stories of everything that can go wrong. But what can you expect if things go right? What will you be able to feel? Are there different medicine options to be aware of? What kind of clothes are better to bring to the hospital to deal with the incision site, etc.? What are the things that no one tells you and no one really talks about? Like, do you still need all the pads and those lovely hospital panties afterwards? Sarah, I know you had to do three C-sections. I would love to have you share your knowledge and insight with those of us that are going through this for the first time. Okay. I have a lot to say, obviously. I had three. For those who don't know, I had three planned C-sections, which is unusual. Um, Kara has so many specific questions that I'm going to kind of go through them quickly, um, which will, I think, get to most of my tips. So I love that she said, what can you expect if things go right? And I just want to validate that I think it's not a lot of people talk about planned C-sections because a lot of the birth stories we hear about that end in C-section didn't start out with that as the plan. So I, I think it is, it's a good point that you usually hear about quote unquote emergency C-section. You don't often hear about like, what's the, what's the protocol for a planned one? So um, we'll go through a few of um, Kara's questions, but one of them was, what will you be able to feel? So I assume Kara that you mean in the delivery itself, like the actual operation. Um, a lot of people will say you feel like a weird tugging sensation. And for me, that was, that it was accurate. Um, I was numb from any pain from about the rib cage down, but you're still aware of sensation. Um, I had heard through other people that sometimes the numbness goes up higher and can make you feel like the sensation that you 
aren't breathing, which of course you are breathing, you're conscious, you're breathing. But if you're numb at the rib cage, it, you, you're not aware that you're breathing. That I was nervous that that would happen to me. It didn't happen to me. It can happen to some people. Um, and you will be fully conscious, or I was fully conscious, I should say. So um, I think most people are and able to talk kind of in real time with the doctor and nurses. And they'll, if you want them to, they'll kind of talk you through what's happening. I think some people like that. I like more information. Some people would maybe rather not know what's going on. You can't see a lot, but you can feel the kind of strange tugging sensation as it's described. And I would say that's accurate. Um, and you can also have the doctor or nurses kind of walk you through what's happening if you, if you like that. So that's kind of what you'll be able to feel and experience. Um, she asked, are there different medicine options to be aware of? So I would say Yes. And my first disclaimer, guys, you know, this is not real medical advice. This is just my experience. So please do your own research. But when when we say medicine options, I have there's kind of two things. One is the anesthesia you experience during surgery. And the other is the pain medication you have when you, when the anesthesia wears off. So for anesthesia, um, if you've had a spinal block or an epidural before or any experience with major anesthesia, I would tell your doctor and nurses about whatever you've experienced in the past. I hadn't, I didn't have any experience with that kind of anesthesia. So I was going in new to it, but if you do, it's worth, it's worth telling them what your experience was because there's so many different anesthesia is so patient dependent on how people experience it. And it's not that the doctors are doing the wrong thing or giving you the wrong dose. It's that they truly don't under, they don't know how patients will react until it's administered. And that's why you will have an anesthesiologist with you the entire time. Um, and so if you have experience, definitely tell them what you, what you experienced in the past, because it may be able, it might be able to have them guide you or guide your, um, what they administer to you as anesthesia. But, um, I had a spinal block, so it goes in like an epidural. Um, but it is a complete block from whatever, um, place that they put it down and they wait for you to get numb and they say, can you feel this? Can you feel this? And it's, it's weird, but it was fine. It was okay. Um, there's a lot of different reactions or I, I should say side effects that can happen during that spinal block, but you have that anesthesiologist next to you the whole time. So there's like shoulder pain, headaches, um, the shakes, nausea, it's all possible, but it, you might have none of those things. And one thing I was blown away by was one time I was having I don't remember. I think nausea, like waves of nausea and it was my blood pressure dropping or something. And when they adjusted something in real time, it went away immediately. So you, it, it's very strange, but you have somebody there that you can tell them what you're experiencing and they can sometimes make an adjustment. So that's kind of the anesthesia piece. The narcotics that they give you as the anesthesia wears off, um, there's, I think, a wide variety of options because it's, it's just pain meds. I had morphine or something with morphine the first time and I did not react well. I felt really out of it, really drugged. It was my first baby. And again, this is not during surgery. This is more like in the 12 to 24 hours after. And I did not like it. And I told them that the second time and they did. I mean, it was like ibuprofen, not, not the dose you would take, like, right. but, but it was just, it was something totally different. And I didn't have any of the morphine side effects. So, um, all right, should I keep going? I have a lot of information. Yeah. Keep going. I'm learning. Okay. So I think those were like the, the longest ones. Um, so she asked what kind of clothes are better to bring to the hospital to deal with the incision site. I would say it's not really any different than a vaginal delivery, but you probably won't wear your own clothes almost the whole time. You might stay in a hospital gown longer because you won't be able to walk around very much at all. They, they'll want to get you up and moving, but you get up like once an hour for a minute and then you lay back down. You're not, you're not doing much for the first, you know, mm. couple of days. They will check your incision site quite a bit. Um, so I don't know. I, I barely changed out of a hospital gown, which I feel like sometimes if your vaginal birth is relatively easy, you could put on, I don't know. Can you, Megan? You put pajamas. on yeah, pajamas. Yeah. I just don't remember. I remember mostly being in the hospital gown. Um, yeah. Well, it seems like it gives you more ac than more access and yeah, it's loose. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to, you don't want anything touching the incision. Yeah. Right. So yeah. yeah. And when you're not, um, the hardest, hardest part of the recovery is your abdominal muscles have been 
literally moved aside and then put back where so they crazy. belong. And yeah. so you have no abdominal like acts, like strength is the wrong word. You don't even like, you can't like you, locate the they muscles. They don't almost. exist. Yeah. And then there's a fair amount of pain that you're managing yeah. with medication. So sitting up and lying down is, is really, so you're just not changing your clothes would not be fun. Like there would be no reason. So just stay in the hospital gown. And it, and, re- it reminds me of when I had a hysterectomy and trying to pee Mm-hmm. And being like, I can't locate them. Like, I know yes. how to do this, but I can't. The muscle that makes this happen is not connected anymore to my brain. Like, yes. some, like the wires were seriously crossed. It is. And I think, and then um, recovering from anesthesia also kind of dulls and deadens all yeah. of those like responses. So it is a, it is a strange feeling, but in terms of packing clothes, you don't have to pack anything special. They'll, they'll provide you with everything you need. Um, okay. What are the things that no one tells you? I I think a lot I already covered, but one thing that surprised me was just how many people are involved. And I don't know about a traditional hospital birth. If you're giving birth vaginally, if it feels this way, but in the OR, there are a lot of nurses. There's an O there are special OR nurse specialists. Um, there's your anesthesiologist, there's the team for the baby. So it feels like a packed room in there. Um, another thing nobody told me, is how hungry. So my, always my first tip is you will have to fast for 12 hours, I believe. So I had C-sections at usually like 11 in the morning. So like close to midnight the night before was the last time I could eat. And I, the last, the second and the third time I put a peanut butter sandwich by my bedside. Cause I knew that I'd be getting up to pee in the middle of the night. And I wanted food in my belly as late as possible up to that fasting window, because it's not just the fasting before surgery. So you're hungry and you're nine months pregnant and you can't eat or drink anything, can't have coffee. And then you have surgery and they will be very slow to let you back on solid food. So, um, I, I mean, my first C-section, I went from Monday night to Thursday without solid food, which is like, if you've never been without food, that's a long time to go without food and you're hungry. Um, they do ease you back on solids slowly. So like you can, you can have broth and then you can have like, applesauce and it's not quite as bad as it make it sound but that was a big surprise to me that is such a mean <laughs> I know. it's mean to have to go that and long without i always food. felt like like with a vaginal birth like you can just have this huge cheeseburger like right after like you're yeah. still wiping sweat from your brow and eating french fries and well, i just and now felt they've like, even changed the rules about eating during labor in a lot of places okay so it's not as much of at least in my experience and from what i've heard at least recently it's not necessarily unless you're medicated it's not as big of a deal as okay. it used to be, but like what I think is so interesting about the eating thing is like keep in mind and this is just a general thing that has to do with any medical procedure you're gonna have okay this is like the nurses and and all the medical people this is their job they see this every single day and the fact that you're hungry I'm not gonna say they don't care <laughs> but it's like so low on their scale of things to worry about yeah I mean I feel that way when I have to fast before I go in for a blood draw yeah and I'll be like are you sure? Like on the phone, you know, they called the day before to make sure you to go over everything. And I'm like, wait a second. So I can't eat at all. Like, and then I'll be like, well, how quickly will you get me in and out? And then yeah. they can't guarantee. I'm like, but what if I don't get to eat breakfast or I'm lunch hungry? and I don't get to eat it tonight either. Or like when you would go in to get an ultrasound and you'd have to drink all that water, I would always get so paranoid and I would try to like nail down um, the nurse on the phone and be yeah. like, okay, so if I come in with a full bladder, are we going to get to it right away? Or am I going to wait? And she'd be like, ma'am, I don't know. And I was like, well, I don't know. I don't think you understand what you're asking me to do then because I can't come in there like with a gotta go bladder. <laughs> we need some clear expectations. Exactly. And you're, but you're right. Gonna, they don't, but you're not going to no. get it. They're not going to provide that. No. So like, yeah, like I, I don't even, there's no solution. I guess just that they're not going to care. Like agreed. <laughs> it's just so routine. Yep. And, and it, they've seen, they've seen worse, no matter what you have, your problem is they've seen worse. Yes. So it's not going to impress them. Well, the other thing about the hunger is we were talking with Kelsey on our team about this and she also had three C-sections and she said she was eating much sooner after. And so I don't know if that was like a location or a doctor specific thing, yeah. but basically like you have your system after being, after having major abdominal surgery and being on anesthesia, that you just have to be really delicate with your digestive system. So any, yeah. this is true if you've had other kinds of any abdominal surgery. So they want you up and moving around. They want you to pass gas. They want you to have a bowel movement. And so the slowness of the introduction of food, I believe is just kind of not wanting it to do anything that's going to shock or further disrupt that system. Um, with Violet, I did, I knew that eating and drinking would help me feel 
good sooner. So I really tried to kind of accelerate that and say, look, I'd like to try to have some oatmeal or I'd like to try and have the broth sooner. And they make you, it's like, first it's broth, then it's juice, then it's, you have to kind of graduate to the levels. And I remember like the menu they would hand you in the hospital was like, had you cleared for like, you can order from this list of things. Cause you're on the clear liquids only, or you're on the mushy foods only. And I just tried to kind of like just push it a little bit so that I was eating sooner after Violet. And it did help. It helps with your energy. It helps you just feel like a human. But if you do too much too soon, you'll be barfing and doesn't feel good to barf when you've had abdominal surgery. That also um, has happened to me. Oh, ouch. Well, I want to, I mean, I've never had a cesarean, but I have had surgery. Uh-huh. Um, and it made me, when I mentioned the thing about not being able to pee, it reminded me of a, um, of an experience that I had where when I couldn't, like I couldn't pee. And, and I think I was so paranoid about dehydration that I was drinking fluids all day long, all day long, all day long. And they had also told me that I might have to be catheterized if mm-hmm. I couldn't pee. What I think I actually did was counterproductive because I was also on an IV. Yeah. So I had a, I was getting uh... an IV drip all day long and then I was drinking water all day long, but my muscles weren't quite engaged enough for my body. Like my bladder was like distended and my yeah. body couldn't figure out. Yeah. How to get it was like too out. much. Yeah. It was too much. And so I finally, um, called in a nurse and begged her to call the doctor and have them take the IV out, which actually took like two hours to get approved. Hmm. And I, and they did. And then I was able to pee because they okay. were like, we're going to catheterize you. I was like, no, please don't. Let me just like, let me try something else. Yeah. Right. And I guess the takeaway for me from that was that again, the medical staff, like you're a unique human being yeah. and they aren't going to intuit your needs. Like right. they're busy. They have a lot going on. So if you really feel like something isn't working, Yeah. Like you're probably going to have to bring it up and you might have to fight for it. And you might have to bring it up with several different people. That is one frustrating thing about a hospital stay. If you've had relatively low medical intervention in your life, you feel like everyone should be talking to each other and reading up on your chart, but you you find yourself starting the same conversation over and over again. I'm really glad you brought up catheter and IV because in case I, it might, I, like I didn't mean to skip over it like a given, but you will have a catheter for probably 12 to 24 hours after, and then an IV for almost 48 hours, like, or 36, like yeah. it'll, they'll, they'll keep checking you, but you will need IV. Your, some of your pain meds will come through IV and your fluids. And I think the catheter comes out first and IV next, but it felt like a long wait. And once those things are out, everything, nursing the baby, getting up to walk to the bathroom. So it's an intense couple of days. Most people stay three nights in the hospital. Uh, my last time I did only stay two, but that was, I was a pro by then. So it's, right. it is an intense couple of days. Um, the last question she said was, do you still need all the pads and the hospital panties and everything after it's a really common question because you haven't delivered vaginally. So people aren't sure, like, do you bleed the same way? And the answer is you do bleed like a heavy period for several days. Most people do, but during surgery, they actually like irrigate a lot of those systems as they stitch you back up. So there is less, there's less blood, but there is still wash your uterus. They do. (laughs) They like take it out. Like Like with the, like with one of those toothpicks, like the, like a water pick. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so they put it back in and, and so it is less and I haven't, I haven't delivered the other way, but I think it's less bleeding, but you still, you pass clots and you still do all of that for, I don't know, a, a week or week and a half. Um, but I've heard that it's just, it's just not quite as much, but you have all the afterbirth, you have everything, everything else. Um, and then the last thing that nobody tells you just on a happy note is the one thing that's kind of nice about a planned C-section is you haven't gone through any worry or trauma of a birth that's not going the way you planned. Um, And I think there's a lot to be said for, there's a lot of disappointment for people who find out that for whatever reason, they're going to be having a C-section. And there's some grief, I think, associated with when you have to make your peace with that decision. But if you've made your peace, I mean, I think I was like 33 or 34 weeks when I knew then you're going into, you're well rested. You've had your peanut butter sandwich at midnight. Everybody's expecting you. And there's honestly, there's kind of a feeling of like, as long as everything is going well, it's a very happy feeling in the operating room. They'll take pictures of the baby. It still feels like a celebratory birth. It doesn't feel like an emergency. And I think um, there's something to be said for that. If you have to have a planned one, at least you don't have this, um, you know, you haven't labored for 10 hours and now you're worried. And the, there's like these stress, yes, the stress you're going in. Um, and so I always, I always was pleasantly surprised at how comfortable the OR felt from a, like emotionally, it felt like an emotionally happy place. They were, everybody was excited for you. They'd say, let me take your picture. And so it's not, maybe not the way you envisioned it, but it still could be a happy birth experience is just what I wanted to say. like that. Yeah. 
All right. That was a lot to cover. That, that was, was like Sarah's you, C-section. You were like an expert. I know. That, so. <laughs> um, okay. So we have one final question. It comes from Kim. I know we're both going to have some comments about this, but we will listen to Kim's question now. Hi, Megan and Sarah. This is Kim from California. And I have a question somewhat specific to families of three or more. We just had our third this fall and my older two are four and six. And because of those ages, taking care of the older two is pretty much the same. They eat the same, play the same, sleep the same. And then we have baby whose care is completely different than the older two. And because of this, it feels a little bit like we have two sets of kids, the older kids and then the baby. So I'm just curious, um, for Sarah with number three and Megan, um, maybe with the later kids too, at what point did you start to feel like a cohesive family instead of just having two subsets of kids? Thank you guys so much for this podcast. It's such a great resource. Please keep it up. Okay, Kim. Yes, I totally know what you're talking about. In fact, I feel like Sarah, did we just talk about this not too long ago? The whole sets of kids thing. I think it was when we were talking about kids and friendships. Maybe, and I was, yes. And I was saying that I felt for so long like my kids, they were a set, so their friends came in sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, until a certain age. So I had one set, and then I had two sets, because there were the boys two years apart, two groups of boys, and then a caboose. Because Clara came along um, three and a half years after Owen. The sets, the existing sets were already well-created, established, and she was my only girl. So, um, you know, she was kind of my buddy for a long time. So we were a set. Mm-hmm. But I would say it really started to shift when the bigger kids moved out of elementary school and into middle school. Like when they started to make those school hops from elementary to middle and then from middle to high school, the groups began to mix up more. Mm. So Isaac and Jacob had always been really close, but then, and Owen and Will were always playing together, although they fought a lot too. Um, When Jacob moved into middle and then especially into high school, Will and Isaac, who were in the middle there, became closer. And then Clara was finally old enough to be a decent playmate for Owen. So they started spending more time together. Um, the boys as a unit really became pretty cohesive around the time Owen was old enough to like play some of the games and Mm -hmm. watch some of the movies that they liked, but that was very much a boy thing for a long time. And then Clara has really always been a little bit on the outskirts. I think that she kind of likes that she has me. She's kind of more of a solitary person. Um, but she likes to be part of the gang, but she doesn't have to be up in their stuff all the time. Like she's, she's not really been ever one of those little, little sisters who's always trying to get in on what they have going on. I think she's been happier to kind of hang with me and, um, and that kind of thing. But now when we're all together, I will say even as a divorced family, when we're all together with my ex-husband, like we are definitely like a family unit. And yeah. it has been that way for a long time, probably five years, five or six years. Like when Clara became a good conversationalist, yeah. that was when it really gelled. And we all like feel like when we're together, we are a thing, like yeah. a unit. Um, and and that, now of course I it's think, different. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, and that I think is what Kim is most like going for is like, right. it's not that it's not that there's never going to be like different pairings of people who kind of work right. well together, but like, when will this feel like it's the five of us in her case or the seven or however many of you there were <laughs> seven. Well, of you. honestly, for me, what I think when it really started to happen for us was when mealtime stopped being work, like mm. so much work and started becoming fun. Um, if you think about it, when you have little kids, it doesn't even matter how many you have, if they're in sets or not, mealtimes, which should be like a great family bonding experience, feel like, I don't know, like running interference, Mm -hmm. like, like running zones. Like Mm -hmm. you've got a toddler you're trying to keep from throwing their food on the ground. And then you've got a preschooler who keeps trying to leave the table and mom and dad often have their attention divided. And it's really when everyone can kind of engage at some level, that's when at that dinner table or on the road trip or whatever it is, that's when I feel like that cohesiveness starts to happen. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's, it's about the sets, but it's also about the age of the youngest. I often. think, okay. So that, and that's, I'll jump in there because my, I have such a clear memory of number one, feeling like heck, I had two kids and a baby, two kids and a baby, like these two, and mine aren't even as spread out. Um, Kim's are four and six when she had the baby, mine were four and two. So mine were pretty close together, but it still felt like two kids and a baby and then two kids and a toddler. And it was the summer that Violet was like two and a half, a bunch of things kind of, she potty trained herself. Um, she moved into a big kid bed a few months later, um, a naps, she started to give up naps. So I feel like when we were out of diapers and done with naps with the youngest, 
that was, it was a game changer in terms of the things we could do as a family. She always liked to play with the olders. It was never out of a lack of desire on her part, but I would say by the time they were three, six and eight, that began the golden years. And, and now at six, nine and 11, we are starting to see the golden years have been the last three years, probably three and a half years. And now it's two kids and a tween, right? Because like now I'm going to have a middle schooler. And I, I think this is, it's somewhat around sibling dynamics, but it's, I think it's more about like what you said, like, when do we feel like we're a unit? And for me, that really happened when the age of the youngest reached no diapers, no naps, and just certain other, like you said, meal times got easier. We could eat out at a restaurant, no high chairs, all those, yeah. like the trappings of toddler hood just fell and away. And the way they suck all the air out of the room, <laughs> the life out of you. Well, the babies and toddlers yeah. take all the attention, like, because they have, their needs are, everyone has to pay attention to make sure they don't run into a, you know, a flame or something. Yeah. So it does suck away some of that family cohesiveness and then you get it back. Yeah. When they get older. And then like you said, you have the oldest who at some point is going to have her own agenda and her right. own stuff she's trying to do and will move out yeah. one day and that changes things again. But you will get to the point where when you get all back together, it feels like you, it feels like a thing. You know, I agree. And like I want to say like for people who have a bigger age spread, um, you know, there's an eight and a half year age spread in my family. And we still I mean, we had we were in very different phases, but we still felt like a family unit, I think. So yeah. I don't think there's I don't think you need to fear that it's not going to happen because of either this age spread or this personality temperament. Like you will create that feeling of family, like cohesiveness. But I also totally remember the feeling of two kids and a baby. And it, you know, it did yep. last a couple of years. So. Yep. All right. Oh, we covered a lot of ground and a lot of very diverse we topics today. Like talked fast today. We did. <laughs> Don't we speed did. us we, up in your No, no, we life. made it. Well, we got, we packed a lot of information into not very much time. Um, so I'm excited about this thing we're doing with our cue it ups now. Yeah. Where we're too. talking not just about ourselves, which we obviously like to do, um, where we like to tell you, you know, something to check out after you're done listening to us, but we're telling you about other podcasts to listen to. Yeah. That aren't ours. Yeah. Yeah. There's so, so many good, good ones in this space. So it's going to yeah. be fun the next few weeks to kind of highlight some of our friends in this space. Yeah. So we're talking this week. We want you to check out the Midlife Mixtape podcast. The host is Nancy Davis Co. I've, I feel like I've just known Nancy forever. She's like one of my old, old school um, social media blogging peeps going back way back in the day. Um, but her, it's a really well done podcast. It's to celebrate Gen Xers at Midlife. Um, and she does these fantastic interviews with other Gen Xers about how they're thriving in the years between the way she puts it, being hip and breaking one. I love it. <laughs> I know we do. Um, and, you know, let's let's all like define, let's loosely define midlife here. Like, I don't think of myself as middle aged yet, no, I think but I she still said 35 is what yeah, I, mean. I find a lot of, like there's a lot of um, cohesion between what's going on with me and, and the show yeah she's had awesome guests like mtv vj martha quinn do you remember martha she had the coolest haircut uh, the go-go's bassist kathy valentine and jonathan Rausch, author of the happiness curve why life gets better after 50 so you should totally check out midlife mixtape you can find her at midlife mixtape.com um, or on itunes stitcher google play or wherever you get the mom hour I love it. Go check it out, guys. Um, And just a quick reminder, thanks to everybody who has done our listener survey. It is still open. You can find it at themomhour.com slash survey. And we are really appreciating hearing from you guys. It doesn't take very long. You can pull it up right on your phone right now before you go listen to Midlife Mixtape with Nancy Davis. Go. Thanks. Yeah, we love we love reading the responses and it really does help us. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. 